I think that South Carolina is going to be so much stronger for the schedule that they've faced. They're going to be so much stronger for the loss that they took. And I think that is the ethos of how Don Staley wants South Carolina to play this year, which is that you're going to make mistakes. Things aren't always going to be working, but are you hustling back on defense? Are you getting back to the defensive identity and turning that into offense? And we're seeing that from the Gamecocks. I think South Carolina can absolutely win the entire NCAA this year. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's edition of The Late Sub. I am your host, Claire Watkins. It is Monday, December 9th, and we're going to take a little walk around once again in the world of women's sports. We're going to talk about the WNBA Golden State expansion draft. We're going to talk about some of the moves in the AP Top 25 for college basketball. We got college volleyball, college soccer, PWHL. We got some NWSL movement. There's a lot of stuff happening both on and off the court. Big end of year vibes, and there's a lot to discuss. So let's jump in. All right. So this is starting to feel, I think, very year endy in a way. We're seeing a lot of business being done off the court, off the field. We're seeing people plan for 2025. There are some nice college wrap up things going on, whether it's volleyball or college soccer. You're seeing those seasons end. You're seeing college basketball is maybe the one big through line of, of what we're seeing through the winter into the early spring. But it's been a nice mix, actually, this weekend of some really interesting business things off the court, off the field, and some interesting things going on on the court, particularly in in volleyball, basketball. And like I said, we're seeing the wrap-up of college soccer. No spoilers when this comes out. So I, I want to talk a little bit about some of the businessy stuff, some of the off seasony stuff, and we'll dig into this a little bit more later in the week as well. And then we'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing in these other sports where people are still kind of playing because it's fun to watch this stuff over the holidays. The, the college basketball slate has been so, so fun the last couple of weeks, and I'm very excited to see some of the, the big games that are coming up later in December as well. But I think the big one we got to start with, and like I said, we're going to dig in a little bit deeper into this later this week, is the Golden State Valkyries expansion draft. So that mechanism, there was maybe some confusion going into it, maybe still some confusion coming out of it, but the Golden State Valkyries joining the WNBA, part of the mechanisms of these sort of parity rules Rules. Maybe if you're an NWSL fan, you're familiar with these. Maybe if you're uh, an NHL fan, like you see sometimes men's leagues doing this as well, there's an expansion draft. It includes protected lists for each of the current teams in the league. And then there are players that are available to be selected. Now, there were some also mechanisms in this particular expansion draft that I think influenced the way Golden State went about it. We'll talk about that in a second. But ultimately, the idea is Golden State, like many American sports, they were not expected to just come in and only be able to sign players in free agency or people who had maybe their rights or were out of the league or Europe or anything like that. They also have a chance to pull some of these, these role players, not necessarily the big stars, but some role players off of other teams to create competitiveness because it's very, very difficult to create a competitive expansion team in its first year. But also that's good for the league, right? So the league has this impetus to want these teams to come in and be competitive. The other teams kind of also want that because they want the league to be competitive, but also they don't want Golden State to come in and be like incredible right away. Golden State does not get the number one pick in the draft. They're picking number five, so they don't necessarily have the greatest mechanism in the college draft. As people know in soccer, before they abolish the draft, they would give those number one picks to these teams to, again, kind of further the competition. So Golden State comes into this, I think, with a lot of considerations. Consideration number one is that they want to pick some players that they want to play for their team. Full stop. Another consideration is they want to have assets that they can move around for trades. And then the third thing is they just want to have, they want to remain in play for some of the big free agents in this offseason, which you cannot actually start negoti negotiating with until late January, and you cannot sign until February. So this is part one of a number of different puzzle pieces that will end up being the Golden State Valkyries in 2025. But let's get into who they did select and kind of what I think their thought process was there. It was kind of in two different buckets. They had players that were, were good contributors for teams in 2024, and then they had players that might be interested in playing for Golden State who are not currently in the league, which again is that consideration for keep the cap space kind of wide, keep these pieces in play, so that when you do go into the free agency or you do go into trades, you have some assets to work with. So. Those contributors that people might recognize from the 2024 season, Temi Fagbenley out of Indiana, Kate Martin, Las Vegas, Kayla Thornton out of New York, Monique Billings out of Phoenix, Veronica Burton out of Connecticut, Stephanie Talbot out of LA, Cecilia Zandalassini in Minnesota, and Julie Van Le in Washington. Some of these players are really impressive and are going to play for Golden State. I think that the names that really stick out Fag Benley got very, very good minutes for Indiana. Kate Martin is a fan favorite who is good off the bench, good spark, good locker room piece. 
Thornton was a very important part to that New York championship run last year. Again, she's one of that. We always talked about New York's great depth. Thornton was a big part of that. She's just got a great big brain for basketball. Very, uh, she has a, she just has a lot of authority on the court. Monique Billings is a player that kind of bounced around a couple of teams. She was out of the league for a little bit. She gets back into the league. She is notable in that she was their one unrestricted free agency pick, which means that because she was unrestricted and they're kind of quote unquote sort of taking that choice away from her, she's going to be cored by the team. Likely, she's going to likely get something near a max contract. Burton, very good defensive player. Van Lo was kind of the break out star for Washington despite their struggles last year. She's a good shooter from outside. She's got a great brain for competition. There are going to be players of that bucket that absolutely are signed and play for the Golden State Valkyries, but not all of them necessarily, right? They take 12 players and they are going to be moving things around, which is why I think you have to take a soft touch with something like this, because it's not fair to take a player in an expansion draft where maybe they were settled with their other team. And then if you don't have room for them, you, you wave them, you cut them. That is, you You want to be kind of playing ball. You want to be competitive, but you want to be playing ball in the, in, a, in somewhat of a friendly, sportsman-like way so that these players don't get hung out to dry, which is why I think they also took some flyers on players who are not currently in the league who play in Europe. Um, their selections out of Dallas, Atlanta, and Chicago are all players that maybe would be interested to come play to gold for, for Golden State, but are not currently in the league due to some of their considerations in Europe or some of them have national team. They have national team duties that pull them away from the league. So I don't want to like over or understate how important the expansion draft is for, for Golden State. It's incredibly important. Those players are going to come in and get serious minutes. Like I said, there are some fan favorites in here. So there's some really good contributors off of the bench. There are some players that absolutely can start in a starting five in the WNBA, but this is just part one. And I think that this is why sort of the coverage of the expansion draft is it kind of is what it is, which is that, yes, there are some incredible picks here, but if you're looking for big splash stuff, I think everyone's talking about the big free agents that are going to theoretically be available in February. I mean, Kelsey Plum is a player that everyone's excited to see kind of what she decides to do. Um, you've got Satu Sabali, who's an unrestricted free agent. You have some of those veterans out of Connecticut who are unrestricted free agents. There are more things at play here, and you have to think that Golden State's going to be a desirable location. You saw all of these players who were selected express just how excited they were to, to make that big leap. And, and, I, and I liked seeing that as well because I do think that expansion draft are hard. They're hard on players. It doesn't feel good. I mean, I, one thing that I kept saying is like, it doesn't matter where you are in the depth chart. It doesn't necessarily always feel good to feel unprotected. Again, doesn't matter if you know that you're a bench player or you know that you're down on that depth chart. Doesn't feel good to be unprotected, but it is always feeling good that a team that's coming into the league wants you to play for them. So I like the way Golden State handled this. I thought it was not overly aggressive, not overly cautious. They got some players who they're really going to enjoy having play for them. And they've also kept a lot of options open for the future, which they're going to need. But moving on to basketball, let's talk about a little bit some on-court basketball, college basketball. It has not slowed down at all. We'll just say that. A lot of nice non-conference matchups. We're seeing some good ranked conference matchups already. It's been a good mix so far. I think that college basketball, the reason why March Madness is so addictive is you do get to see all of these teams play each other. The regular season has always been a little bit more of a nebulous thing to grab onto because you do, you get stuck in conference. You end up, if you have like a weak non-conference schedule, you're seeing really good teams, you know, blow out much smaller teams. But what do you really learn from that? I've really liked the mix that we've gotten um, in the last couple of weeks. And I think that you're seeing teams actually be rewarded for scheduling tough rather than be punished for it. For example, South Carolina, they schedule as tough as anybody. Sometimes they struggle down to be able to schedule tougher because they're not a team that a lot of people like to play because they're a tough out. South Carolina, as we talked about last week, they they lost to UCLA, so they're no longer undefeated. They're no longer the number one team in the AP poll. But then they rattle off two huge top 10 wins. They beat Duke and they beat TCU and they beat them by a lot. And it's not close and the defense looks good and the shooting was on. I think that South Carolina is going to be so much stronger for the schedule that they've faced. They're going to be so much stronger for the loss that they took. And I think you really do have to consider, like, if perfection is not the goal, which it shouldn't be, those those teams should be celebrated, the ones that pull off being undefeated, but that is never the ultimate goal coming into a season. But you really have to consider, okay, so they did lose a game, but the ranked teams that they're playing, these games are not close. These other teams are not getting into their offensive rhythm and they're not able to stop South Carolina on the other end. Like, I just can't think of a better example than the play that Ashton Watkins had against TCU this weekend where she gets blocked, right? It's an unsuccessful offensive possession. She hustles back. She gets the steal. She gets the breakaway and she dunks it. And I think that is the ethos of how 
Don Staley wants South Carolina to play this year, which is that you're going to make mistakes. Things aren't always going to be working, but are you hustling back on defense? Are you getting back to the defensive identity and turning that into offense? And we're seeing that from the Gamecocks. I think, you know, South Carolina can absolutely win the entire NCAA this year. I think just really interesting to see. Again, they take this loss, but then it's just been bam, 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 these ranked wins, and they are not close. Speaking of not close, UConn also looks very good. They beat, uh, they had a ranked win. They've got three ranked wins on the season so far, though none in the top 10. They beat Louisville, very strong game from them. I just want to, again, shout out, I think I've mentioned this before, but Sarah Strong, their freshman, their highly touted freshman, has been playing incredibly well for them. She looks like a natural, just another one of these incredibly talented freshmen who is ready for this stage. UConn's box scores concern me slightly. I think that's maybe my only concern with UConn is just you're not seeing kind of that that spreading of the scoring. You're seeing it very focused on certain players. Obviously, Paige Beckers is one of those players. Sarah Strong is one of those players. AZ Fudd has been playing very well, though she tweaked her knee this weekend. Hopefully that's nothing major. Um, they just need more consistency, I think, from the rest of the team because you do start to get concerned. You're like, okay, what happens if some of these stars go cold or if it's too easy to make a defensive game plan against them? So UConn, incredibly talented, but I am just like, you want those box scores to be slightly more healthy, I think, going into some of these tougher matchups. The UConn-USC game is going to be a banger for that because I think USC struggles with some similar things when it comes to like, how do you create a healthy offense that it's sharing the ball, that's getting everybody the touches that they need rather than relying on your, your big stars. Um, a little bit lower down in the AP 25 or top 25, you know, you see Tennessee, they get their big first win of the Kim Caldwell era. I think everyone's very excited at the prospect of Tennessee kind of regaining their stature at the top of, uh, you know, of college basketball. Um, they beat Iowa. You've got TCU kind of coming back down to earth to make a generality. You know, I watched kind of a, a wider swath of games this week. I caught that LSU Stanford game that went into overtime. That game was really interesting. LSU is one of those teams that doesn't schedule super tough in non-conference. So any of those good teams that they play, it's a great chance to kind of get a sense of how they're actually doing. I think Michaela Williams is the big standout for them out of that game, but you do see kind of where things kind of start to drop off a little bit. And I think it's not surprising that it's around kind of that top 10 mark. I watched Ohio State's win against Illinois and it was really nice to see a player like Cody McMahon back for the Buckeyes and they're currently at number 11. But you do watch that game and you go, okay, I think we're starting to see where you've got the truly elite teams. You've got Notre Dame, for example, who bounces back after their losses. They beat Texas. They look really good despite sitting at number eight. But then you get a little bit further down into 10, 11, 12, and you go, okay, this looks a little bit more like what you expect out of just sort of that mid-level top 25 college basketball. So I, it's early days. It's early days. But maybe South Carolina, UConn, those are the good examples of what we're seeing at the top. And then we're going to see some rising and falling in the middle, like a team like TCU who are going to get some good wins and they're going to have some tough losses or like Ohio state who are going to have some good wins and some tough losses. Um, but that's nice. It feels very healthy. It feels like we are no matter what, if you tune into one of these major conferences, you're going to see a good basketball game. And that's what you want out of the regular season where you can't really make any huge declarations about what's going to happen in March. Now checking in on NWSL, this is going to be a little bit of an extension of what we talked about late last week, which is that this trend of players leaving Gotham has continued and may actually continue beyond this podcast taping. So three players have exited Gotham so far. Delaney Sheehan, Maiton Lopez, and Sam Hyatt have all moved away from Gotham. They've also already announced their signings, which I think actually makes sense. They're unrestricted free agents. They're not necessarily leaving to leave, but they've gotten better offers and they're ready to jump on that. I've talked about this before. I think it's really nice that the NWSL has free agency begin basically right at the end of the season. It keeps us talking about it. It keeps us seeing these trends. I think that down period for the WNBA is really, really tough because you just kind of have to sit and wait until you're going to find out what some of these teams look like. Um, I, I mentioned this last week, but I do want to kind of underline, it really does feel like the CBA effect here where all players out of contract are automatically unrestricted free agents. They're able to talk to teams immediately after their season is over. And these personal considerations like playing time or raises or any other kind of things that a player might value in their own personal career is going to come into play. And we're seeing that already play out. Like I mentioned, Sheehan, who's a starter for, for Gotham, who was a very good starter for them and Gotham played very well this year taking that contract with Houston, which was not played, who did not play very well last year and don't actually have a leadership structure yet. But, you know, there was some reporting that maybe there's a considerable, considerable pay hike, right? The cap is going to really influence, I think, parity at this juncture. I don't think that this is necessarily a, a trend that we can follow as we figure out how uh, college players are going to be signing with different teams. 
but I do think this, this Gotham motion where you've still got these top line players, you have a number of players who want more playing time, like Lopez or like Hyatt, they move to teams that could really use them. You know, you got Lopez who moved to Chicago could really use her. You got Hyatt who moves to Portland. They could really use her. They need that center back depth. And, and so it all makes sense. And I think you are going to continue to see a balancing out due to some of these parity rules kind of written into the CBA, but also just player choice as parity. Every player is going to have different things that they want. And you're going to have players that are like happy probably to take a little bit of a pay cut to be in a good environment and, and win things and, and kind of sit maybe on a stacked roster. But that's not really the nature of how NWSL players think all the time. They want to play. They want to play. They want to have a viable career. They want salaries that make sense. And, and I think they're going to have plenty of really good players who are very happy to kind of take that leap and bet on themselves and move out to these different teams. So I don't think this is like a danger, danger Gotham moment. I think it's just very natural that if you do have a stacked roster the way that they do, you're going to see other players want to move. And that in and of itself is going to maintain some of the balance, I think, competitively for the NWSL. But I am still very, very curious about what this means for college players. I, I mentioned this on Twitter last week. I believe it. I think that just because the draft is gone doesn't mean that I think programming should end. I really, really hope that these teams have infrastructures to talk to the players that they're interested in out of college, even if they don't have agents. I really hope this doesn't turn into like an open tryout kind of culture, which I think is very tricky and very stressful for these players. I would like to think that there will be maybe executive meetings where GMs are talking to each other. They're figuring out how they want to put things together. They're scouting all of this different stuff because that is the one portal or that is that one avenue that I'm still a little bit worried about, which is how do college players get seen by teams, which up until this point have maybe had limited resources for scouting and need that draft mechanism to select these players. So happy to see this in free agency. I think free agency and player choice is a great equalizer, but still questions about college, I think. Speaking of college soccer, let's just jump right into it. Like I said, no spoilers. We're recording this on Monday. The game will have been played tonight when this goes out on Tuesday. Wake Forest versus North Carolina for the championship. Um, Wake Forest in their first championship game, UNC in their billionth championship game. I was very struck actually by UNC kind of blowing out Duke three to nothing end of an era for Duke in coaching after they had had an incredible regular season. They win the ACC, but they still just can't like always the bridesmaid, never the bride for Duke. Um, my one main thought on the college cup though, kind of jumping off of that thought about what the player pipeline looks like going to pros is I think the college cup is going to continue to evolve and change. It's moving out of carry this year. It's moving to Kansas city next year. They're going to be playing at CPKC, the home of the Kansas city current, but I think this is the ongoing conversation with a lot of college sports, and I don't think that women's soccer is immune to this, which is there's going to be further professionalization. There's going to be players that are looking for the pro pipeline well, long before they would be scheduled to graduate college. You're going to see probably we have a lot of informal academies in the NWSL. Um, you might see more formalization of that. You're going to see you know, people sign in, in, you know, training camp contracts, those kinds of things. I am going to miss though, what the college cup is every single year I tune in. Cause I think to myself, these players could go on to win world cups. They could go on to win Olympic golds. They could go on to win the champions league NWSL championships. And they're still going to remember these games. These games matter to these players so much. I think, you know, we talked to Kelly O'Hara frequently at JWS and how often like she and, and Allie Riley like bring up that Stanford game against UNC in the college cup, how that sticks with a player, a young player for the rest of their career, no matter how many things they win is really beautiful. I think college soccer is a fabulous thing. You're watching Wake Forest's coach tear up. You know, he's, he's crying thinking about bringing these seniors to uh, the college cup final this year. You know, you've got UNC who's kind of figuring out who they are in a new coaching era, or again, Duke moving into a new era of coaching, which again is kind of influenced by the way the sport is changing and the way players are kind of thinking about college soccer versus the pros is changing. And, and I just love, I just love it. I love the college cup. I love what it means to the players. I love what it means to the coaches. I love what it means to friends and family of these players. There's so much heart to it. And as we know, heart doesn't pay the bills and I'm okay with like, I'm okay with the further professionalization of, of the pipeline, because I think that's really important to create viable careers and to just continue to strengthen the, the player pool in the United States. But there's something to this that's going to get lost probably a little bit and I'm going to miss it. So that's my final stamp on, on college cup. Congratulations to whoever up, ends up winning tonight, two teams full of players that we're going to see at the higher level for sure. And then a couple of really quick ones. 
Let's check back in on PWHL last week. All I had to say is that Sarah Philly is really good. And that continues to be true. But also what we're seeing is six teams. There's going to be parity. You're going to see teams kind of right the ship. Every team, I think, has a win at this point. Boston got theirs this weekend. And then you are seeing kind of that ebb and flow. New York much, much, much better due to, in part, the play of the number one pick that they got in the draft. But you're also seeing Minnesota kind of pick things up, last year's champions. The, the nice thing about the PWHL, to me, because I do think it's tricky to watch a six-team league it's small. You're seeing a lot of repeated games, but I do really enjoy thinking that pretty much anyone can win at any time. And you're seeing that competitive cauldron get deeper and deeper and deeper. And so just tune into the PWHL in the States. You can watch it on YouTube. You can watch it on a variety of other broadcasters in Canada. You never know exactly what you're going to get. And I think that's the exciting thing about tuning into a game. And then just to mention volleyball, it's kind of the opposite, which is that the volleyball NCAA tournament has begun. We've gotten through the first two rounds and it's been mostly chalk. Number one seeds have made it through Pitt, Louisville, Penn State, and Nebraska. Um, all of the number two seeds have made it through except for rest in peace to SMU. They were the highest seed to fall in the first two rounds. Everyone else has looked pretty strong. I still think we're probably destined for some big quarterfinal matchups between some of these number one and number two seeds. That's going to be very exciting. You've got the potential for you know Nebraska versus Wisconsin. You've got the potential for, for Stanford to make a little bit of noise. I think they're in, in Louisville's quadrant. I, I'm just excited to see how that plays out. It's been a year of, of big pro programs and big names and, and big conferences. And that has continued to play out in the early rounds, but this is where it starts to get tough and really exciting. So tune into ESPN, see what you've got for, uh, for these volleyball games, because this weekend and next is going to be fierce. And so that's that for today's episode of the late sub. Hope you guys enjoyed this walk around women's sports with us. Shout out to producer extraordinaire Parker Fenton. I am your host, Claire Watkins. We're going to have more of this later this week. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into the thought process behind the Valkyries expansion draft and some of the considerations as they hone a new WNBA team, because that is a big, big deal. Um, and we're going to have much more from the world of women's sports. So thank you all for listening and we'll see you later this week. Mm-hmm.